Okay, any other questions? Now, if you remember what we were doing yesterday, we were looking at the ideal gas, uh, well, the uh, kind of the ideal gas, non-interacting system of particles, but also taking into account the quantum mechanical influences, I, uh, the property that they are indistinguishable in a more precise manner than just this one over n factorial proposed by Gibbs. And we had obtained the Q potential if you remember, this was the uh, logarithm of the grand canonical partition function. And we had seen that this is just PV over KT on one hand. And we had also seen that this should be equal to uh, 1 over A sum over the logarithm of 1 plus A Z e to the power beta epsilon. This was what we had derived. And this number A is uh, 1 for fermions minus 1 for bosons and 0 for Maxwell-Boltzmann particles. By Maxwell-Boltzmann particles what I mean is the, uh, those particles for which their indistinguishability is taken into account by just this 1 over n, fa n factorial. <coughs> Now, this here is a sum over the uh, single particle microstates. And so we can replace it in the thermodynamic limit by the integral, if, especially if we are at high temperatures, such that the temp thermal energy is uh, negligible compared to the discreteness of the levels. So then P PV kT would be just 1 over A d cubed P d cubed Q divided by h cubed times the logarithm of 1 plus a z e to the power beta epsilon. And this, uh, nothing depends, if the energy, if you are looking at non-interacting particles, without, there's no, if there is no external potential, nothing depends on the position of the particle. So this d cubed q integral will just cancel the volume. So we obtain the pressure of the system as kt over a 4 pi p squared dp divided by h cubed logarithm of 1 plus a z e to the power beta epsilon. This is the pressure of the system. Now let's do a simple integration by part. Now what, I'm, what I will be trying to do is I will try to relate somehow the pressure to the number of particles. Remember the number of particles is again sum over the states of uh, 1 over e to the power beta epsilon z inverse uh, plus a, which can be written as uh, in terms of an integral v times 4 pi p squared dp over h cubed 1 over e to the power beta epsilon z inverse plus a. Well, of course, in the expression of the pressure, we have the logarithm in the expression for the number of particles. We don't have the logarithm of more or less the same expression. So what we first need to do is just get rid of that logarithm. And we can get rid of that logarithm by doing an integration by parts. So the pressure we can write as kt over a, 4 pi over h cubed, p cubed, derivative with respect to p, times one third, this is p squared, times the logarithm dp. p goes from zero to infinity. Now I can do the integration by parts. So this becomes kt over a, one third, 4 pi over h cubed from 0 to infinity no, uh, p cubed times the logarithm minus 0 to infinity p 
p cube d by dp of the logarithm integrated over p. And here the p limits p starts from 0 to infinity. Now in both limits it will be 0. So this just uh, leaves us with 1 over 3 kt over a 4 pi over h cube times minus 1 from 0 to infinity p cube. Well, the derivative of this logarithm is just the only thing that depends on p is epsilon. So it is beta a z e to the power beta epsilon divided by 1 plus a z e to the power beta epsilon that is d epsilon by dp integrated over p. Now this kt cancels this beta. This a cancels this a. So this is equal to 1 over 3. Let's keep this minus 1. 0 to infinity p divided by z inverse e to power minus beta epsilon. Did I make a mistake somewhere? Plus a d epsilon by dp times 4 pi p squared dp over h cube. This is the pressure of my system. Oh, uh, yes, I have one sign mistake here. That this is a minus. So here we have a minus. Here we have a minus. There is a minus 1 due to that minus. It cancels this minus 1 over here. So everything is the same except on this one. Now at the same time, n is one third from zero to infinity, uh, one over z inverse e to the power beta epsilon plus a four pi p squared dp over h cube times v. All these numbers, no, there is no one third. So this we can write as 0 to infinity, let's say, dn. If we write it as from 0 to infinity of dn, all these numbers uh, contributing to our dn, then p, or pv, is nothing but 1 over 3 p times d epsilon by dp of dn. Or, let's just multiply by n and divide by n. Now, if you look at that parenthesis, what that parenthesis, uh, now there's one more factor that I missed. There's a z over here. So there's a z over here. Or no. Is there a z? No, there's no z, sorry. Well, you see, there is this number, p d e by d p. We are summing this value over all the particles and dividing by the number of particles. But that's nothing but the average. So p v is n over 3, the average of p d epsilon by d p, which is n over 3 p times what is the derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to momentum? No, just remember your analytical mechanics courses. Hamiltonian is derivative with respect to momentum. Q dot, the velocity. So it's just P, let's say U.
or pressure is n over 3 pu. Well, this relation, one thing is, okay, one thing independent of the type of particle you have. Of course, that average will depend on the type of particle, but whatever is appearing over here, p, pressure, p is the momentum, u is the velocity, it's just only the kinematical factors that appear over here. And in some special cases, let's say if epsilon is, let's say, c times p to the power s, c being some constant, then uh, the epsilon by dp <coughs> is just s times epsilon over p. So pv or p is n over 3 p times, this was what we had drive, p times s epsilon over p. Well, the p's will cancel, so the pressure is just s times uh, n over 3 times epsilon, or pv would be equal to s over 3 n times epsilon. Epsilon is the average energy per particle. If you multiply it with the number of particles, you get the total energy. Now, you so say again, this is independent of the type of particle we have. Of course, we had made some assumptions. And the main assumption is that here we assume in all these steps that we can replace the sum by an integration. And that is only valid in the limit that the discreteness is uh, negligible. So basically everything starts behaving uh, as an ideal gas. Of course, the dependence of energy on temperature might, be, might depend on the particles, but as long as we can replace the summation with an integration, the relation between the pressure, volume, number, and the energy will be given by this relation. Now let's see how else we could have derived this relation. <coughs> In the book it said kinematical factors. Now this is somewhat we had done, we had all, we should have all, did we discuss the uh, ideal gas law in the beginning of the semester? From the kinetic theory? Yes. So th in the book there is a, let's say, a more detailed derivation, but the idea is basically the same. Now, what, what we will be doing is, let's just assume we have our gas confined to some volume, and then there is some area over here. Now, the question is, what is the pressure exerted on that area for an arbitrary distribution of the velocities? Now, we will first define a function f u being the velocity of the particles, if u times du or d cubed u is the fraction of particles that have velocities close to u. Close to meaning that just imagine our velocity space there is a volume around u uh, whose size is d cubed u, and uh, this is the fraction of particles within that volume. So since it's just a fraction, if you just sum, every particle has some kind of a velocity, f of u du over all u, this should be just one. This is just a normalization, since we had defined this f of u as a fraction. Now the next question is, which particles in my system that have the velocity u will be hitting this area. 
in a time, let's say, dt. Well, in a time dt, all these particles will travel a dis distance u times dt. So just if we imagine some prism around this area, who is, uh, whose length is u times dt, all the particles within this volume will hit my area within that time dt. So the number of particles within that volume would be just, let's say, this area is dA. Within that volume, uh, well, the volume is <coughs> dA times u dt. This is my volume. The fraction of particles within that volume will be n times Well, let's see, if u is in the direction of the a, cross product is a number. So this is my volume. How many particles are there within this volume that has a, a velocity around u? That's what we are interested in. Well, that is n times f of u times d cubed u. So this is this number. number of particles within the above volume that will hit the A. And, well, yes, that will hit the A. Well, there are other particles whose velocity within that volume, whose velocity is not close to you, but they, since they are not moving towards my area, they will not hit my area. Now, what is the momentum that they exert? What is the momentum that will be transferred? <coughs> now, if we assume that the A is in the Z direction, each one of these particles will exert, will uh, transfer a momentum to Pz. If initially they have a momentum Pz, after the collision they will have a momentum minus Pz in the z direction. So this is the momentum that they will, 2Pz will be the change in their momentum in the direction of the area. So that will be the momentum transferred to that surface. So the force exerted will be 2pz dA dot u dt and fu d cubed u divided by dt. The force is the momentum transferred per unit time. So these cancel. Now, if we divide this by area, let's say dp, well, this is just 2pz uz and fu d cubed u or the total P pressure will be just 2PZ UZ and F of U D cubed U.
Now, just uh, one point d cubed u. We can use spherical coordinates to write this d cubed u. It will be there's an integral over theta, an integral over phi. There's a, a sine theta and du u squared. Okay, we want all magnitudes. We want all angles phi, but we don't want all angles theta. It's just from zero to pi over two, because others will not be moving towards my area. So let's go back. P But you see, if you look, if, let, let's go back over here. This is the pressure, and in, when I'm integrating over all the values of u, I have a, I'm restricting kind of uz. I'm integrating over all u with the restriction that uz is larger than zero. But you see, if you look at the integrand, f of u, which is the, frag, the kind of the velocity distribution, it should depend. It should only depend on the magnitude. There's no preferred direction. So it's an odd fun it's an even function of u of z. N is just a number. U of z is an odd function of u of z. P of z is an odd function of u of, u of z. So the integrand is an even function of u of z. So if I restrict my uh, in integral to u z larger than zero, or if I remove that restriction, the difference is just a factor of 2. The integral over u of z less than 0 is the same as the integral of u of z larger than 0. So p I can easily write as, without the two factor now, p of z, u of z, and f of u, d cubed u. But this is nothing but n times p z, u of z. which is n times p u cosine theta. Cosine squared theta, which will be one third n times p u. Okay, does this look correct to you? <laughs> well, it is almost like the expression we had obtained before. But there we have the particle density, not the total number of particles. So what is our mistake? You say here, we had put an N. Either we have to, from some place, obtain a 1 over V, or from the start, that should not be the capital N, but smaller. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. 
So it's the, fraction, the velocity, frag, velocity distribution, but those particles are distributed everywhere. We are looking at uh, the fraction of particles within that velocity range per volume, and then multiply it with the volume to get the total number within our volume. So that is what we had missed. So actually, this should be f of u du divided by v. So everywhere, this is not the capital N, but the small n. Now, any, other, well, any questions up to here? Well, you said the, this derivation has the nice advantage that it doesn't make any assumptions about this shape, etc. And we can just do, if u is equal to, let's say, p squared over 2m, this just gives us p, now this is small n. one over three n and uh, p is equal to mu. This is p squared over m and two over three n times epsilon or pv is equal to two thirds times e. independent of the shape of the container. And this was actually what we had derived in the beginning of the semester also. Now we can also ask one more question. Suppose we have a container, a large one. And somewhere on the container there is a hole. Somewhere here there is a hole. with an area dA. How fast will the gas exist, uh, exit through this hole? So-called the effusion of gas. Now also keep in mind that in this derivation over here, okay, the only statistical concept we had kind of used is f of u. That is, the particles should have some velocity distribution, some speed distribution, actually, uh, that is independent of time. It doesn't have to be a thermal distribution. Even if it's not a thermal distribution, this derivation still holds. Of course, if it is not a thermal distribution, then we cannot relate PV to some kind of a temperature. The system will not have a temperature. But nevertheless, its pressure times its volume will be two-thirds the energy, whatever that energy is. Well, if you are looking for the effusion of gas, basically it's the same argument. You see what we had done over here. We had take, considered that area this is the number of particles that hits that area. We just multiply this by 2pz to obtain the momentum transfer and divide it by, let's say, dt. Well, just do not multiply by 2pz. Then you get the number of particles reaching that area per unit time. Let's say the uh, rate, well, let's just sum over all the possible u's times 1 over dt times 1 over dA. This is the number of particles that the, uh, per area, per unit time, that passes through our leak, which can be written as r is equal to u z, dt's will cancel. Uh, 
f of u d cube u n this is u z this is just n u z this is n let's say u z is u times cosine theta Okay, the theta sine theta, theta goes from 0 to pi over 2, d phi, du times u squared times u, times f of u. Well, let's see, what is a 0 to pi over 2, d theta sine theta? cosine theta is minus cosine squared theta over 2 from 0 to pi over 2 when pi over 2 it is 0 it's just 1 half well without the cosine theta This is just minus cosine theta over 2. No, sorry, from 0 to pi. There's no over 2. Huh? There's, There's no two. over 2. You are right. Theta starts from 0 to pi, so this is just 2. So basically, R. R is just. 1 over 4 times n times from 0 to pi over 2 d theta sine theta d phi from 0 to 2 pi this is phi du u squared u f of u 1 over 4 n d cubed u f of u just u. 1 over 4 n times the average of u. Nothing depends on the area. Nothing depends on? The area of the wall. Well, you see, this R and the pressure is something per area. So R is the number of particles that is leaking per area. Pressure is the force per area. Mm -hmm. The total number of particles that is leaking will depend on A. Similarly, the total force uh, acting on an area will depend on A. But not the uh, number of particles per area or the force per area. So that's kind of the nice thing about this approach, let's say, mm -hmm. compared to what we had done at the beginning of the semester. Can you explain that 1 over 4 factor into the... You see, this is 2 is equal to 1 over... Uh, or or let, let me put it this way. 1 over 2 is equal to 1 over 4 times 2. So instead of integrating theta from 0 to pi over 2, including this cosine theta, mm -hmm. I can just integrate over theta from 0 to pi, excluding this cosine theta. But of course, I have to divide by 4. So you see, if you look at this expression at the top of the screen and this line over here, basically this cosine theta is missing over there. Uh, sorry, this is not pi over 2, this is pi. Here, the upper limit is pi over 2. Here, the upper limit is pi. So I replace this theta integral theta integral of a uh, cosine theta sine theta over theta from 0 to pi over 2, I just replaced it by an integral from a theta of sine theta from 0 to pi. But then this replacement just uh, adds a factor of 4, this 4. 
this integral is four times the original integral. So I have to divide by one over four to obtain the original integral. Yeah, I see that, but without doing any calculation, can you say that? Well, you see, you can do the same thing with, without doing any computation, just doing some, uh, you see, for example, in our previous case, uh, you can say that, okay, uh, how many sides do we have? Six sides. One-sixth of the particle is moving in the plus x direction, one-sixth is moving in the minus <coughs> x direction, one-sixth is moving in the plus set, one-sixth in the minus set, uh, one-sixth in the plus y, one-sixth in the minus set, minus y. So if I would just give an intuitive uh, interpretation, let's say, of this computation, instead of 1 over 4, I would just put 1 over 6. Because 1 over 6 of them are moving in the, towards the, my area. But 1 over 6 and 1 over 4, their order of magnitude is the same. This is more precise, 1 over 4. This will be especially important when we study black body radiation. You see, what's the power emitted by the black body? We just model the black body as an empty hole in which inside there is the radiation is in thermal equilibrium with the container. Then the power emitted by the black body is just the amount of uh, energy that uh, escapes from a hole on the, uh, in this container. So that is where we have this 1 over fa 4 factor also. just one topic left from this chapter. Now you see, up to here we have been always ignoring the internal structure. Mm -hmm. so we, have, we were looking at structureless point-like particles, identical or distinguishable or indistinguishable. But we just ignore their internal structure. Mm -hmm. So what happens about when we, they, we have the, their inter internal structure? You see, even when there is an internal, the, the basic idea is always the same, if you have not. There is some partition function that we are trying to calculate, which is sum over some uh, microstates of e to power minus beta epsilon, or in some cases e to power minus beta epsilon minus mu n depending on whether you are doing the canonical or the grand canonical part, uh, ensemble. Now, your system, the only thing that changes from one system to another system, or whether you are taking into account some influence or the other influence, is how do you sum over that microstates? If there is no internal structure, the, the microstates of my system are determined by the, basically the kinetic properties, where they are, and what is their momentum. But if there is some internal structure to my systems, then the microstate of my, of the part, if there is an internal structure uh, of the particles making my system, then in this sum, the microstates will also be determined by the internal structure of my particles. They don't have to be all in the same state. For example, if the uh, temperature is high enough to excite the electrons, if I'm looking at an atom, and there are electrons, if the temperature is high enough, not all atoms will be in the same uh, internal s state. Some will be excited, some will be in the ground state, etc. We have to take that into account. Or if the atoms or the molecules have some spin, well, the spin can be oriented in different ways. So depending on in which direction the spin or the angular momentum is oriented, they all correspond to a different microstate of my system. So in that sum, we have to take that into account also. And, well, let's give a break now, a 10 minute break, and then we will continue with the internal structure of the particles in the next hour.